This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live on a Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. And you know what that means. It means Hawaii, the state of clean energy, right here, right now. Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which we care deeply about. Right, Maria Tome? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and the topic is transportation. Of course. Yep. And That's so, your topic. You hey, love transportation. yes. Transportation. Yes, yeah. yes. So the Energy Policy Forum has a transportation group. And, you know, we try to keep up with what's going on and look ahead at what might um, be necessary for us to have the transportation future we want here in Hawaii, especially from the energy perspective. So we're very happy to have with us today Lauren Reichelt, Transportation Lead with the Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii. So Lauren, That's welcome great. to welcome the to the show, show. Lauren. Nice, nice to have Thanks you for here. Yeah. You guys. yeah, this yeah. is good. Uh, so okay, so that said, there's a few basic fundamental things. For example, <clears throat> the acronym is STITCH. Correct. S-T-C-H. Stitch. It's Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii. Yes. So, versus is LUS. <laughs> All right. So, the Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii is a U.S. Department of Energy Clean Cities program. So, um, there are around 90 coalitions countrywide, and this is one of the coalitions. So, it's a local coalition of stakeholders committed to reducing the petroleum that's used in the transportation sector um, yeah. through various means. Why here? Why Hawaii? You said 90. There's more, you know, than 90 places this could have been, but it's right here in Hawaii. So will we select it or what? Uh, it's been around for a while. So we used to be Honolulu Clean Cities, and we recently rebranded to the Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii. But, um, yeah, it was a, it's a grant program, and we had um, applied years ago, and so it's been around for a while. And um, Blue Planet Foundation administers that program, um, so I'm a, and you live within the Blue Planet right. so umbrella I'm a, there. I'm a Blue Planet Foundation employee, and I just am also the coordinator for the coalition. That's great. Yeah. How long have you been here? Um, here, here. 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 Doing this. Doing this. Uh, I've been with Blue Planet Foundation a little over two years. Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, because of that, you can still talk to us, right? You can talk to Maria and me. And the Energy Policy Forum and Think Tech? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so <clears throat> what does Stitch do? Do you mind if I call it Stitch? Yeah, no. Okay. Please, please. What does Stitch do? Give us give us um, sort of um, its, its, its mission as it exists here in Hawaii mm -hmm. and the kinds of things you do and you call, you cause to be done here at, as part of the coalition. Sure. So... Um, reducing petroleum in the transportation sector is our general mission. Um, that's the U.S. Department of Energy's Clean Cities Program mission. And we do that through a number of means. We um, try to educate our policymakers and stakeholders and um, also advocate for certain policies um, as they come up. And, uh, and also educate, so... For example, one program that we're looking to launch soon is the is an EV expert certification program for uh, car dealerships. So it'll be a so dealership gets certified. Uh, individual individual sales associates will oh, get certified. So we're looking to certify one to two sales associates per dealership, um, so that they are highly versed on the incentives that exist for electric vehicle ownership, the technology. Um, how to sell an EV? It's a different, it's a different way of talking to a consumer, and it's a different consumer in general. So, um, being sure that there is a cohort of sales associates that are very knowledgeable about EVs, and and we don't come across any, any yeah, issues that's a, there. Yeah, that's a great so idea. That's something that we're working on as well, and that'll be launched. We're going to be pushing that soon. Are you um, going to do the teaching? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I think we'll find, find um, an industry yeah. expert what about to, Maria to do here? that. Yeah, you want to do it? No, it's <laughs> okay. I'm good. I'm kind of busy. A whole bunch of other stuff. Sharon but, Lori Walkie. What? Sharon. Oh, yes. No, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they're going to have folks she who are... She has an EV after but, all. Yes. I think you have to have an yes. EV to be able to, you know, be an expert in selling It EVs. definitely helps. Right. Um, certain sales associates I've talked to who own EVs tend to, A, they're a little more evangelical about it. They want to 
they want everyone to be into EVs also, but they also understand the lifestyle shift that accompanies EV ownership, and that helps when you're selling a car and uh, explaining to people how they can fit it into their life and uh, that they're not going to be, you know, stuck somewhere charging for, for know, an hour. The flip side of that, the back side of that, is that the dealer now has an expert. The dealer has a, a kind of a, a consciousness about EVs, maybe mm -hmm. they didn't have before, um, and that means dealerships are going to change. They have to change anyway to deal with EVs, don't they? Yeah. A different repair, a different, a whole different protocol on how to handle the, EV, the EVs. And you know, I mean, they could turn their backs and say, "Well, sorry, we don't do that," but that's not smart. <laughs> so my guess is that dealerships will change if they have to get other equipment, if they have to get training, yeah. not only in selling but in maintaining and repairing and what that. They'll yeah. do that. The market's going to be too big. Yeah, a lot of OEMs have made sweeping commitments to electric vehicles uh, over the last year. They just kept coming for a while there, and and it really, yeah, dealerships are going to have to evolve in order to keep up with that yeah. shift in in product. Yeah, they're going to have to find a way. This is off the point, but they're going to have to find a way to deal with. This is not the right word to address. <laughs> you know the notion that. You know, a lot of there'll be a lot of sales of electric vehicles on the web, not through a sales mm. floor. You go on the web, you know, like buying a pair of socks. You know the model you want. You know, check it all. Like you're buying a computer, you can just do it on the web. Push a button, and it'll be at your front door. So the dealers have to find a way to get involved in that transaction, mm -hmm. uh, either by modifying their you know uh, arrangements for sale, or or by getting in on the other guy's arrangements. You know, for delivery. Um, so they can be part of the process. Anyway, going to the, the session, because we like news. Yeah. Uh, what positions did you take? What happened? Yeah, so there were a couple of um, transportation-related bills that we were following in the session. Unfortunately, none of them actually went through. Um, we didn't see a lot of progress on the transportation front. When you say following, you mean you, you were promoting them? Or? We were. We were supporting them and um, providing input along the way. But um, yes, yeah, so, yeah. So one was a bill to electrify Hawaii's rental fleet. Um, so that addresses a couple of things. It reduces the emissions associated with um, passenger vehicles. So the rental fleet is the largest passenger vehicle fleet in the state. Um, and then, so it also increases the secondary market of electric vehicles, which makes electric vehicles cheaper for the consumer. Um, which is great because they haven't reached cost parity yet, so they're still a bit more expensive than ICs. Mm -hmm. So. Um, increasing that secondary market with the turnover of rental fleets, and then also um, branding us as a, a clean tourist destination, which um, we talk about sometimes, but um, it's not always the case. So, so what, 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 those don't sound like hard bills. They don't sound controversial. <laughs> well, it requires the rental fleets to incorporate EVs into their fleets. Were they agreeable? Um, I think that they probably know it's coming, but they don't want to be told when. When those it's a question of when. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that unfortunately that bill didn't didn't go through. Um, but we are looking into next session and figuring out how to how to figure out how to get that through. And then um, another one was a EV charging infrastructure bill. So it was a bill that was looking to actually cut incentives on EVs. Right now, there's free EV parking at the airport, um, and the bill was looking to make that reduced to only 24-hour segments. So Blue Planet Foundation came in and, and said, basically, you know, EVs don't even make up 1% of our entire vehicle um, stock right now in the state, and it's too early to be cutting incentives. So if we're going to be cutting that particular incentive, we need to put something into the bill to benefit EV uptake. So we added a piece in there that says that all new multi-unit dwellings um, or workplaces or, or large lots need to have 25% of the stalls be EV charger ready. So they don't actually have to have an EV charger in them yet, but they need to be wired and electrically ready for an EV charger to be installed in that space. That's just like the uh, the California statute I told you about, that uh, every new house has to have solar yeah. solar on the roof. This yeah. is Every new condo has to have uh, EV, at least be EV ready. EV yeah. ready, yeah. yeah so yeah. Vancouver recently passed a bill that says that 100% of new builds have to be, or of the stalls that the new builds have, or builds have to be EV ready, um, EV charger ready. So... That's very, I mean, much more aggressive than what we're looking to pass, but we, it's a lot more expensive to go back and 
do sure. construction on these spaces after the fact sure. to make them And you were only, this bill was only talking about prospective, right? It wasn't talking about right. re it's, refitting. Right. So no. it wouldn't cost anybody for a refit, just right. prospective. It now, was, if it passes uh, later, then you have to go back. Well, that's you can't go back. This is too expensive to go yeah. back. Yeah. So the beauty of it is, look, we're, it's forward thinking in, in that it's, Going to keep costs down in the long run. Yeah. Although it's an initial cost, it'll save money. Yeah, that's a, that's I think it's around three, Both three times more expensive to do it later. Points, you know, those are good. Yeah. So, so what was the resistance on? Um, I'm not sure on that one exactly, but it, it didn't go through this session. But it's something that again we'll be looking into next year and keeping an eye on, especially yeah. if they try to start scaling back on incentives this early. Yeah. Um, Need incentives. So what about did you did anybody get involved in the uh, EV tax credit? which went away just mm. psh, like that. Uh, we don't have it anymore, and we need it. We need it to incentivize the sales of EVs, don't we? Yeah, we didn't get too involved in that. Um, it is, I mean, it is a, a great incentive, and it's been shown to improve EV uptake in, mm -hmm. in other areas. Yeah. But Well, you can, if you look at a chart of EV sales in the state of Hawaii, it was going pretty good until the incentive expired, and then poof. It's not going as well now, I don't think. You know more? Nope, don't know yeah. more. <laughs> I could look it up. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. so those Anything are Anything else in this session? Those are the two that we were mo mainly focused on, yeah. Um, there was another bill that we initially submitted or, or were working on that was um, in EVSC ratio, so the infrastructure. Right now there's a bill that says that one stall, or one stall if a parking lot has at least 100, one stall has to have an EV charger. So if it has 1,000, it still only has to have one stall. Um, That's not adequate. Not adequate. So we had created a, a bill that had ratios um, tied into it and, and would increase that, but it kind of morphed along the process. And it's Resistance? No, it just changed. Uh, it just kept getting mm. altered, and it's not really the same bill anymore. So um, that didn't pass either, and, and we aren't. Mm. Really looking at that next as a year. So next much. Year. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're looking forward now. Now that session's over, being able to um, focus on transportation programs, um, education programs, and and working with you know candidates, and then doing potentially doing a legislative briefing before next session. Just it seems like these um, EV bills end up in front of legislators and. There may not even be a general knowledge around EVs, where it's hard to understand what's good policy and what isn't around electric vehicles if, if someone isn't very comfortable with electric vehicles in the first place. Um, and the same thing goes for other methods of, of clean transportation. So we're looking at doing a um, clean transportation briefing prior, to, prior to the next legislative session. Can and I come down for that? Absolutely. Is it going to be a ride and drive? We can, yeah, we can combine <laughs> it, make it a ride and drive event. Yeah, we have a ride and drive coming up too, actually. Um, there's a an electric vehicle ride and drive event coming up on May 19th on Saturday. We'll what, have. What is that? Yeah, so our ride and drive events, we invite a number of dealerships to bring various electric vehicle models and plug-in hybrid models, um, and then it's open to the public, and you can you can take cars out for free test drives. Just it's it's nice because you don't have to go to every single dealership to try all the different models. Bring them all to one place, and you can just get in one after the other and really compare them in a direct way. Um, and we're we're partnering up with Revolution on that. Mm, uh, are they getting involved in such things? Yeah. Well, so the best way to charge your electric vehicles through your house it's, through rooftop oh, solar. Sure. Oh, sure, um, sure, sure. So yeah, we're working with them. It's going to be at Salt at our Kakaako on May 19th from 11 to 2. Okay, at Salt, okay. Yeah. Are there charges uh, down there? Yeah. I, there's one. Oh. I think there's one, maybe two in their parking structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, okay, I'm, I'm really impressed. I mean, so the education, before we go to our break, just one thing mm -hmm. about you. You mentioned earlier you want to educate uh, somebody in every dealership. But what other education? I mean, and, and you're going to educate the legislators. And educating uh, the consumer through our ride and drive events. Yeah. So um, working on multiple levels. You're trying to encourage them, incentivize them somehow to buy an electric vehicle. Yeah. yeah, encourage them. But we also think that there's a encourage, but also just expose. So um, until someone so gets an electric, afraid. right, exactly. It's really daunting initially. And until someone gets an electric vehicle and feels how smooth it is, um, and and how easy it is to operate. And that there is no range anxiety problem. I mean, you, you not can anymore. Get one, take you everywhere yeah, you need there to are go. a couple of models that are breaching that yeah. here on the islands. That shouldn't be that much of an issue. So we take a break now, Laura. Okay. 
Uh, and Maria, when we come back, you know, what do you think we get into this whole thing about what is, what is multimodal and how is it going to unfold? And, and how are all these, you can address this, yeah? If so. How are these little You've pieces going to work together? Yeah. All right. In Kaka'ako and elsewhere. Okay? okay. We'll be right back after this break. This is going to be really interesting. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, harder and every more, let's do what we can. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Bingo, I told you we'd come back, we came back. This is Lauren Reichel, Maria Tome. We're gonna talk about multimodal, what is, Versus loss, multimodal. <laughs> what do we got on the table? How many multis are in multimodal? Multimodal is inclusive of a lot of things. Do you yeah, want to talk you've about got your it? pedestrians, your about. bicycles, your buses, your rail. Yeah. If you've got your, of course, your single passenger vehicle. If you've got other types of vehicles, you know, like your your um, tour buses and whatnot, that would also need to fit in there. So it's a car share. Yeah, yeah. So and, and then of course, if you're talking about integrating with your airports and your harbors, that's a whole nother angle. But I think we're mostly talking about ground transportation as a focus for Stitch. Yeah. And do you call it Stitch? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. So, so how yeah. do you, this is really a hard, it's a planning question. How do you take a city like us where we're so focused on cars to the exclusion of so many other good modes um, and you make it multimodal? I was in Vancouver, um, been there lately. Uh, last summer, and I was just astounded by, you know, the, the multi-modes yeah. and the beautiful places where you could walk or ride a bike or what have you, uh, and, and get a boat if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you change the city so that, to encourage people? So Vancouver um, did something amazing. They set these mode shift goals. So they they said, by this year, we want to have this percentage of all of our trips done by walking and biking, this percentage done by um, cars, et cetera, et cetera. And then they actually reached those goals, I think, two years earlier than they had planned, uh, which is really impressive. And so I think that's a testament to setting long-term goals and then um, with that vision, sort of using that to guide everyone's actions. And um, yeah, Vancouver's awesome. Yeah. Um, here, yeah, we are a very drive-heavy city, um, and I think we're making strides in the development of new bike lanes. Um, right now, they're working to get a budget item restored for a Pensacola bike lane, um, and like complete streets in Chinatown is great. The launch of Bike Share has totally um, changed the game, I think, as far as mode shift. So that's successful. I mean, have uh, yeah. they met their goals? Yeah, I, I actually know. changing the way people operate. Yeah, I I think it's been greatly successful. There, every month their numbers had. I mean, I haven't looked in a couple of months, but for months their numbers just kept increasing every month. Um, the usage was primarily residents, not tourists, like a lot of people expected. Um, and I know a lot of people, as someone who works downtown, a lot of people take these bikes to their meetings, to their lunches. Um, they're really accessible and and yeah, I, I think it's the more people ride bikes, the more comfortable they'll be on them. And it also is sort of a, a chicken and an egg situation with you need more bikes to get more bike lanes, but you also need more bike lanes to make people safe on bikes. Um, really? So by launching sure. this program, it's really showing the city and other players that, okay, there are a lot of bikes on the street now. Um, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they're going to be safe and, and we need to have bike lanes and um, okay. pathways. What about pedestrians? I mean, you know, there, there were all this aspirational talk from way back when about a walkway along, you know, from Alamoana Park all the way from, from Waikiki all the way to downtown where you could walk and, you know, and, and have 
you know, a nice experience. Mm -hmm. um, that really hasn't happened. Uh, if it did happen, I think it would change the way people thought about the city. We're talking about a life in the city here. All these things feed into a, a quality of communal life. Um, how do you do that? Kala, yeah. kala. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a conversation for a lot of players because it's the landowners, it's the property owners, it's um, the city and county, it's developers. Um, and so it's hard because each segment of whatever that path would be has so many different players involved. And getting them all to sit down at the table together and figure out all the moving pieces, that's where, the, that's where the chaos comes in. How do you in. attack it? What do you do? Well, so right now we are working with a group of individuals that advocate for um, various things. Some of them are bike advocates, some of them are environmental advocates. But it's the, they're looking to implement a self, self through a bike path. Um, from where to where? It extends, I believe, all the way from the west side, all the way down past Waikiki. Um, and so they've developed these plans and done a few studies on, on that, and they're trying to attack it in chunks. It's the only way you can do it. You can't do it all at once. What's the because first chunk? I don't think there's a first chunk. There's a, there's <laughs> okay. a few ideas. <laughs> there's a few the first, ideas. The first uh, chore is to find the first right, chunk. Right, exactly. So <laughs> they're chunking it out, and uh, we're looking at you know, who we need to talk to to start having those conversations. Challenging. Yeah, it's, it's challenging. very challenging. There's a lot of resistance by property owners. It's yeah. very challenging, but it also, it's an amenity. And if those property owners realize that they're offering something to, you know, all of those new dwellers in those condominiums that are being put up, I mean, it's, it should be valued as an amenity. It's an investment. It's an investment one in thing that happened in Vancouver, which is instructive in this, I and mean, then we would have to sort of reorient our way of reaching consensus, I like consensus sometimes, but not always, <laughs> is that they, they had all these property owners along, along the water there in, in that beautiful area, and that now beautiful area with the grass mm -hmm. and the bike lanes and the walkways, so beautiful. And, this, and these guys said, we, we, we want to build condos, you know, right above that on our property, which was then industrial. And the city said, that's fine, but you have to give us or allow us to use the property Mackay of your condos for these multimodal uses. And if you don't do that, it's fine. We're never going to approve your building. Yeah. Have a choice. And of course, they all caved in. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the permits for the, the buildings were approved, and, and so was the multimodal area. So if you do that, you can achieve it. It's not that hard, actually. You've got to have a little political chutzpah. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. Let's talk about uh, bike, uh, rather car share. Yeah. And let's talk about automated automated cars. I mean, because they're coming, even if they have an accident once in a while and testing, they're still coming. They're coming. And so, wh where does that fit? I mean, should should I wait on my electric vehicle until I can do a share on an electric vehicle? I won't tell you what to do with your electric vehicle choices, <laughs> um, but. Yeah, so automation is coming, um, and along it come or along with it comes a lot of changes to the transportation system, and um, that's another challenge that the dealerships are going to have to face as well. Um, they would be smart to get into that and to, become part of it instead of you know the other side of the street yeah, on it. They absolutely would, and what we need to do though is figure out how to implement them in a in a sustainable way because. So deadheading with those cars, if, if these automated vehicles are dropping folks off and then driving away empty, that's really, it's going to increase the vehicle miles traveled and it's really unsustainable. So yeah. finding ways to be sure that these cars are used, like there's actually people in these cars every time that they're driving. Um, and I think one of the best uses for that is, or best ways to implement those would be sort of the first mile, last mile situation with um, integrating it with public transit and getting people from their homes to public transit stations um, or, or bus stops or um, to areas where they can then walk or bike. Um, not using them for like full rides the way that you would, you know, that with people now grab an Uber and drive across. The state when you have all these different modes and you have all these different stakeholders and players and all technologies all competing for a space to be the center of attraction or at least right. to be on the, on the table, you um, you, you, you will have conflicts where people can't agree. In fact, where finding the right policy is hard to find yeah. because you have to make priorities that seem, seem to shift all the time. Right. And um, I wonder how you do that. Is there a computer program you could use? 
There are, there's modeling software that is coming out to look at some of those things. But um, yeah, I think that the businesses that are, that really get it are looking at themselves as a piece of a larger multimodal system. And once they do that, um, I think they'll be successful. And, and so, you know, here locally, we'll, we'll, re we'll soon be having the, the Holo Holo card that's coming out to integrate bus, um, rail, and then it will be bike share as well, all on one card. And so doing things like that allows people to utilize all the different pieces when they're convenient for them. Right. Um, and to think multimodal. Yeah, it, it allows people to think at a wider scale and at a system level. That's really important conceptually. Yeah. It's not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of, um, you know, looking at your world yeah. as with all these options always available. Mm -hmm. This is very important. I and think. something like that would be really, really useful moving forward. Also, when there's when there is automated vehicles, or yeah. or maybe someday it'll integrate things like car share, Lyft, and Uber, um, or whatever iteration of those exist in the future. And um, yeah, so having some sort of centralized way of of looking at the whole system and what's available to you, I think that. Would, is going to be and will be really yeah. bad. And one of the risks here is we over plan. And when I say over plan, I mean we plan, but there's so much planning going on, we don't do anything. Yeah. You know, this happens, it happens. And certainly there's a, it's a risk when you're talking with multimodal yeah. concept. But I want to tell you about a trip I took and see what you think. This is not an easy situation. <laughs> and so uh, I go to Melbourne. If you've been to Melbourne, you know that it's, it's fabulous on transportation because they have these trams. And in the in this, the CBD of, of Melbourne, which is eight by eight, eight big blocks by eight big blocks, um, they have completely revitalized or totally vitalized that area by what? By free trams, free trams. Mm -hmm. They took all the trams and they make them go this way and that way and this way and that way and around. And so if you want to if you want to get from point A to point Z in this in this CBD, you just get on the tram. That's all you got to do. Get on the tram. That doesn't cost you a second a cent. And, and, the, and the value of that, of course, it's not so much that you save $5. It's that it, free makes you want to do it. Free is an incentive thing, you know. Mm. The notion of free is, oh, I'm saving money, you know, even if it's only pennies. Um, so what's really interesting about that is it revitalized it. Mm. And what the second interesting point is, is that they didn't necessarily focus on electric. Some of those trams are running on old-fashioned fossil fuel. <laughs> And so you have an interesting choice here. I mean, we could take, for example, the CBD here in Honolulu. We say, well, we can plan this thing, you know, and plan it and plan it, and, and by 2045, it'll really be something, aspirationally. Um, and it'll be all electric, it'll be just as beautiful as any planner could ever imagine. Or we could take existing buses, make them free, put them in the CBD, and revitalize everything in the CBD. This is not necessarily consistent with green energy, right. but it works. We know it works. So how do, you rec how do you reconcile those competing factors in the planning process? I don't think you have to. I think that what you're talking about is great to have a thriving central business district, but it's not sustainable. Um, and there's a way to do both. So there's a way to revitalize your central business district while not sacrificing clean energy. Um, and that's, that's the space that we're working in, is trying to work with um, businesses to figure out what's financially viable and also you can use this clean energy as a as an incentive for people to come visit it it's it's exciting and it's new and it should draw people to whatever that is whether it's a transportation mode or a building or or a company so Most people are making people are making choices based on their values and I think that in the end we don't have to sacrifice business for clean energy it must be great changing the world. That's what you're doing, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maria, you, you know, you want to um, summarize or uh, make a comment or uh, put this well, all together for us? Sure. So sustainable transportation is more than just one particular vehicle technology. It's actually encompassing 
the variety of modes and also thinking ahead and being creative and incorporating the cooperation of the county folks and the state folks and the private sector and the non-governmental organizations. There's a lot of outreach to the folks who are making the decisions or making the sales or understand, even just understanding what there is there to be selected from, whether it's the vehicles or or the way of getting around. And so Sustainable Transportation Coalition seems to be doing good things. And thank you so much for reaching out to the public. And yeah. thanks, Jay, for offering us this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. that was a very interesting conversation. I, I have a feeling we could go on much longer <laughs> if we had more time. Yes. There's a lot of moving pieces. Yes. <laughs> yes. That means you have to come back, Lauren. We can do that. We can <laughs> okay. make that happen. Yeah. Right. Thank you guys okay. for having me. Thanks. Thank you, Appreciate Lauren. It. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Aloha, you guys. Aloha. <laughs>